Okay, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get right into the issue regarding the city of Babylon, of course, which is known by in the book of Revelations as the great prostitute. Um, again, this comes as a result of the seventh bowl of God's wrath being poured. And for the most part, again, without going too far uh, in the previous lessons, we've already learned pretty much what those bowls represent, which is, of course, direct attack uh, on the people who choose to uh, still do their own thing and live their own sinful ways and their own sinful lives. But this particular one, this particular uh, effect of the seventh bowl is actually really profound. It really, again, it's still a direct attack on the people, but one thing about it is that now we're actually going to talk about, I guess, a nation, so to speak. You know, again, and for the most part, when you ever, whenever you're talking about the city of Babylon, you're talking about a nation, a group of people, a, a, you know, a colony, a civilization, if you will, um, that actually has a certain belief system, you know, that is actually in opposition uh, to what the will of God is and the way of God. And for the most part, again, knowing that what the seven bowls of God's wrath represent, we already can pretty much put two and two together and reason, if you will, to uh, know what the after effect of this particular uh, circumstance is going to be. But for the most part, uh, again, we're going to be talking about uh, the city of Babylon or the nation of Babylon, however you want to look at it. Um, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in detail. OK, what we have to really understand is that uh, there is really, you know, the we already know that the book of Revelation is, again, very symbolic. And again, I don't know how many times I have to say that, but again, you know, it's still worth repeating. And for the most part, the city of Babylon also is uh, a representation as well. And for the most part, what we have to understand is that every time we're talking about the city of Babylon, we're talking about a disobedient nation, as previously stated. Okay, it's a disobedient nation to God and in, in each and every way possible. It's like, if you will, an honorary nation, a nation that just does not want to obey, if you will. The second part that we have to really understand, again, is that within, even though we have a disobedient nation, there has to be a cause and a reason for the nation to be disobedient. And the reason for that is simple. It's because you have a corrupted government that passes rules and laws and such that, uh, I guess, encourages people to behave in uh, ungodly ways. You know, again, like the passing of different laws that we know are against the moral laws of God, you know, that sort of thing. And I really don't have to go too far in depth. I mean, anybody with any reasonable common sense will pretty much know, you know, that I could be alluding to one thing or many different things, you know. But again, a lot those who actually can think pretty much can come up with ways as far as or think of uh, immoral laws that has been passed in the United States. Immoral laws that have been passed, I should say. But again, you know, whenever we're talking about uh, the book of the Babylon or the city of Babylon, the book of Revelations actually, or I would say John actually went into great detail when he was actually talking about, you know, this particular entity, you know, about, you know, what represent what uh, the city of Babylon represented. First of all, he actually kind of gave it some sort of the city of Babylon. He gave it like he kind of personified it. And what I mean by personification is that he actually gave something that would seem inhuman gave it he gave it kind of like human characteristics and that's pretty much what personification really means is giving something that's not human you're going to give it like some sort of human characteristics it's like you're going to describe it as a person and again when we actually go into the book of revelations and if you all don't know where i am in the book of revelations we're actually right in the area of the 17th chapter so we're kind of we're really moving along we're really getting to the uh coming to the end of this real soon but again when john was actually saying you know uh, when he was describing the uh, city of Babylon, he said that pretty much that he was taken up, I guess, in the spirit. You know, so, you know, he said that an angel took him in the spirit at first and he saw that he saw like a vision, if you will. And what he saw is that he said he saw like a woman, you know, and for the most part, he said that this woman, you know, pretty much was sitting on, I would say, a scarlet beast. You know, and the beast that he was describing it, you know, the beast had seven heads and ten horns. You know, and again, you know, we have to really, again, understand what John is saying because John is being as specific as possible, again, so he can actually get us to really understand what he's seeing. So again, he's saying that he sees this, this woman that is sitting on, you know, this scarlet beast that has, again, seven heads uh, and ten horns. And for the most part, there was a there was something that was written across her forehead, but we never actually really got the exact wording of what was mentioned or actually what was written across this uh, lady's forehead 
again, but we all we know is that it was something that was blasphemous. That's the only thing that John actually told us. You know, it was something that was blasphemous against God's word or against the word of God or against God himself. You know, and for the most part, you know, he went on to describe what she was wearing. You know, he, she said that or he said that she was wearing, you know, he, she wore purple and a scarlet clothing. You know, and she pretty much had jewelry all around her body, you know, made of gold and, you know, precious gems and pearls and that sort of thing. And, of course, he said also that she had like a what? A, a gold goblet, you know, that was also full of, you know, different obscenities, you know, and impurities of her immorality. So, for again, he's being even though he's saying what he's saying. What he is seeing, everything that he is seeing is actually being personified because, again, this is a nation that he's talking about. And the nation is actually being represented by this woman who is holding this cup that's filled with all of these different things, all of these different, you know, ways and acts that God goes against that he knows that, you know, his true believers would not behave in. You know, so, again, her cup is filled with all of these type of, you know, sinful acts. You know, all of these type of things, lying, cheating, stealing. I mean, and it, you can go, the list goes on and on. I mean, again, so her cup is actually filled with those type of things, you know. So, again, you know, he's, he's actually sitting up there, you know, being very, I guess, amazed at what he saw. I mean, this, in a sense, I mean, from any type of normal standing, you know, again, this looks like a woman who is very seductive. Ergo, here we go again. If you could think about this, you know, not to put anything off on women, but women can be very seductive. I mean, if they really want something, if they want to fool somebody, if they want to trick somebody into doing something, you know, the Bible has a history of women, you know, who tricked men, you know, men of God or what have you into doing things, you know, that God wasn't pleased with. But again, you know, what this particular uh, instance of a woman is meaning is that this is something that is actually this seductiveness is being actually transformed not only unto the men, but to all the people who are actually dwelling on the earth city of Babylon you know for the most part so again you know they're being tricked into doing all of these different things behaving in all these unchrist like ways you know and they're actually doing this because again the laws that are being passed on the books are allowing them to do so and the sad part about this understand what I'm saying is that they actually want to include God into the, some of the things that they do they want to say that God is okay with this going on God is okay with that going on God must have meant this. He didn't mean that. He meant this. All of this is actually is what's being represented of what's actually being inside that cup that she's holding. And what we have to understand is that people are not, or I should say preachers and teachers are not really going that in depth to let them know that, okay, this is also a part of the things that is actually being done, that is actually being represented, you know, by what this woman is actually holding in her hand. She's holding, you know, thoughts and philosophies and laws and everything that again goes against the word of God and what it stands for and I wish and I would pray that you know a lot of people in a lot of today's churches would actually teach and know that that's really what's going on and know that this woman is actually just representation of the fact that okay that uh, all of this is going on Again, nothing, we're still in a fighting, we're still against, you know, there's still a lot of fighting going on. The will of God versus, you know, Satan, the beast, or what have you. Because remember, we got to understand that the beast there is still representation. You know, it could be the Antichrist, or it could be the, the Satan, which is the dragon himself. You know, but again, it's up to interpretation as far as who's teaching, you know, that word at that particular time. But I digress. But as we go on, we what we have to do is we got to really understand. We really have to kind of, you know, kind of grab ourselves and really, you know, just kind of just think about this thing for just a minute. All right. Now, we already know that, you know, that the beast that John saw, you know, you know, again, what we have to understand, what we were told is that when one of those bowls was actually poured, we were told that it actually was poured on the throne of the beast and, you know, and such, you know, and the, uh, what is it, the Antichrist, the dragon, and I think the false prophet was cast out into darkness for et an eternal darkness or something like that. If we can remember to go back and study, you know, I think, again, one of those bowls, I think it was the fifth bowl, I'm not sure. But if you go back and actually study the previous lesson that I did on that, where it was the pouring of the bowls of God's wrath, one of those bowls actually represented that when it was poured, that the uh, Satan and his imps, his, his, his uh, posse, if you will, was actually cast out into darkness. But what we have to understand something is that, again, even though he's cast out, he has to actually come back, which means that what? He is still, he is not dead. And what we have to understand is that, again, is that the angel began to minister to John to let him know this. I mean, and again, what we can do is you can still go back 
you know, into the book of Revelation, that 17th chapter, I think it's midway through, where the angel is actually asking him, why are you so amazed? Because he said, I wanted to actually tell you something. I wanted to kind of whisper a little something to you to let you know of a mystery. What he wanted the, uh, John to know is that even though, you know, we, you cast that he's been cast out by the pouring of a previous bowl, he has to come back. And one thing about it is that when he comes back, he has to be, again, tossed into the pit, the bottomless pit, which is what we would probably know of today as the lake of fire. That's what a lot of people may call the second death. Okay? So what we have to understand is that even though he was cast out in the pouring of that bowl, a previous bowl, he still has to come back. And the fact that he has to come back means that, again, that there is still evil that is still going to be in presence, that is going to be actually live at work while he's away, if you will. Again, evil is not going to be gone just because that bowl that he poured, you know, is going to cast his, his posse away. He still has to come back. And when he comes back, you know, again, once he's, once he's actually judged or what have you and, you know, uh, thrown into eternal darkness, that's when it's going to make it where he never exists and we'll never know evil or sin anymore. Because that means that it'll be the end of his reign over any and everything that we know of today. So again, you know, what we have to do is we must, we have to be sure that we keep this information in line so we can kind of like, because again, this again is a thinking man's book. Again, you have to be able to devote some time to study this so we can actually understand and know what's really going on. So again, at this point in time, the angel again mentioned to John, you know, why are you surprised? You know what I'm showing you, you know, this beast is not dead. You know, he has to come back. So in the meantime, between the time that he's cast away and he came back, evil is still going to be present. Okay, so again, it, that goes on again to our last point there that, you know, those who still practice sin will have, you know, the same fate as that beast meeting that they're going to be cast into eternal damnation as well. You know, so again, there's there's no God is not playing. He's saying that when he get destroys evil, ultimately, those who choose to practice evil and those who indulge in evil, those who indulge in sinful acts, you know, you're going to go and be cast with your daddy, which is Satan and that eternal fire. That burneth with briar, fire and brimstone. All right. So let's continue to move on with this and see what's really going on here. Well, now what I really want to focus on now is the scarlet beast. OK, I want to kind of because, again, you know, what we have to do is that in order for us to really understand, you know, what's going on in the book of Revelations, you have to really break things down and cover them one by one. OK, and I think that I, it would be an injustice for me if I actually had to if I just ran through this without actually really sitting down and really actually going through this step by step. So what we want to do now is we're going to actually focus on two parts of this Scarlet Beast. We're going to be talking about, you know, the seven, the seven uh, heads, if you will. And as they said, those ten crowns. OK, those seven heads and those ten horns, if you will. Okay, and I want to what I want to do is actually go into detail to let to see to let uh, the audience know who may be listening to this video. We want to actually go and want, we want to see what each one of those things actually represents. All right. So let's go ahead and start off with you know what's the meaning of those seven heads. Okay. Well, the meaning of the seven heads, you know, again, uh, or they call them the seven heels or the seven the crowns or what have you, represents the seven kings. You know, where this woman, and I put that in quotes, you know, rules. And for the most part, if we actually go back, and this is for really a lot of the scholars, and I'm not going to, I'm not, I don't consider myself a big scholar. But if you actually go back and really do a lot of deep history and a lot of deep uh, thinking and really running, you know, the scriptures and researching, a lot of uh, what we would call, you know, sin in this, so in this state, in this point in time, is actually believed to actually have originated from Rome. All right. And that's all that I'm going to say on that. If you want to know more about that, the Internet is there. Research. I always tell folks to research. Don't just accept anything blindly what somebody says. Go back and research. OK. But for the sake of time, we're going to continue on. OK. Now, what we have to understand is that even with those seven, uh, those seven heads, what we have to understand, there is still something here that needs to be said and done, which is, of course, again, broken down in Scripture. What we have to understand, again, is that five of the kings or five of those hills, if you if you must know, or know another word of saying it, they have already fallen. The sixth uh, king is currently in operation right now. And the seventh king is actually that has it's actually have yet to make their appearance, but meaning that they're going to soon be coming, you know, coming, you know, where they will make their uh, presence known. OK, and what we have to understand, too, there's also really, you know. A meaning. As far as them actually making an appearance and actually coming on the scene, as far as, you know, all of them actually coming out, you know, 
to actually make to, to show themselves. You know what I mean? And what thing that we have to understand is that the whole part about this whole thing is for is God actually going ahead and delivering this final judgment on the city of Babylon. That means that for the most part, since we know that Rome is the area where, you know, uh, sin, quote unquote, originated, God is now getting ready to go now and judge where all of this stuff actually came from. He's, he's getting ready to get to the core, as we would say. Because sometimes in order for you to actually be able to rid something of its uh, poison, of its, you know, philosophy, you have to attack it at its core. And what we have to understand is that this, the city of Babylon is actually no more than actually the core root of all the evil that we know of and that, is, that persists, if you will, in this day and time. All right, which means that now the world is, you know, is at the climax or the peak of Satan's reign, which is, of course, again, what Babylon is all about. Because, again, it's the hub for where all of this sin came from, in a, you know, if you will. So for the most part, when God is actually going in there and actually getting ready to judge the city of Babylon and getting ready to deal with the city of Babylon for her evil deeds. Remember, he did classify it as a her. That means that now, you know, it's going to actually be, you know, he's going to go in and actually completely destroy it. He's going to tear it down where it doesn't exist anymore. In other words, the city of Babylon has their days numbered. That's what we have to understand. What we got to understand something is that, you know, in the breaking down of this, evil is not meant to last always. Evil has its place, yes, but one thing about it is that we have to know is that evil within itself, we have to understand. We cause evil by not wanting to follow the will and the way of God. That's what we have to understand. And again, by God going in and dealing with this, this last real major issue before, you know, everything else happens, before, you know, we have to understand is that God is not afraid to go in and deal with the root cause. See, when, he, though, when that, that bowl was poured and those uh, beasts and everything that was cast into darkness, that wasn't the real final issue right there. That wasn't really dealing with the root cause. This was just something that was temporary because, again, the, um, that angel ministered to John and told him that the angel, is, that beast is coming back. You know, so, again, when he came back, now he's going to be cast out into that lake of fire. This is going to be an eternal death. This is going to be eternal damnation, eternal torment. And again, what God is getting ready to do to the city of Babylon, he's getting ready to do the same thing. He's getting ready to cast it out. He's getting ready to tear it down. And this time when he tears it down, we're not going to know any more things as far as what evil is. Because it's going to be completely eradicated. All right? So now what we have to do is continue. What we need to do now is really understand is that there is really an eighth beast. And I know in the book of Revelation they kind of mention this out of left field. But this, the eighth beast is really the uh, scarlet beast beast right there that you see right there that's one of the uh one of that's the eighth beast okay and for the most part he had let us know also in the book of um in the uh, book of revelation the 17th chapter midway through that even that eighth beast there with those horns and heads he has his days numbered as well see one thing about it he's getting ready to come in there and kick button he's and he's and he is going to take names because one thing about it is that when god says that no more and i mean no more that's what i mean and he'll do any and everything that he can to make sure that there will be no more of whatever it is that he is trying to eradicate. All right. So, again, just keep that in mind. Now, a lot of this stuff, again, you know, is it may seem out of order and rightfully so. But one thing about it, again, is that's where you have the ability to go back and study. So, again, if you don't have if you don't understand a lot of what's going on here, don't feel bad. A lot of people are confused, you know. So, again, just go back and study. That's all that I can actually recommend at this particular point in time. So now let's go ahead now and let's talk about the different the other things that we're uh, that uh, we, that needs to be breaking down, which is the explanation of those 10 crowns. Or I'm just sorry, those 10 horns, if you will. OK, even in anything, like I said, there is still a meaning behind all of that as well. And for the most part, what the 10 uh, horns or crowns represent is that they represent something that we as a nation already are all too familiar with, that we're actually really trying to really uh, keep in the back of our heads and try to grow away from. And that's the uh, spirit of oppression and slavery. It's so funny that, you know, 
all of these things were actually being seen by John, you know, and he's letting us know pretty much what the state of the world is going to be as far as, you know, the state of the economy, how different classes of people are going to be treated and everything like this. And when I actually began to study this, I mean, I became, a, I mean, it, it really opened my eyes because, again, you see a lot of people, you know, posting things about slavery. And, you know, you even have movies now that are coming out in Hollywood that have the a theme of slavery, you know. And, again, you know, we've actually heard, you know, people talk about that on different you know, uh, social websites and even on YouTube and everything like that. But one thing about it, God said, or John says that there's a reason for that. It's because of those horns that he saw, you know, on this beast, on this scarlet beast. That's what they represented, the spirit of oppression, you know, as far as, you know, that demonic king, if you will, who is actually going to be able to rule that, you know, and it's like, and it's something again that he, that he said that it's going to happen in the future. So again, he knew that okay, what well, this is being represented, this angel is telling him this. This is what's going to be uh, going to cause a lot of people a lot of problems because now they're going to have it where you know it, there's going to be a division in the community or in society where different people based on different skin colors are going to be treated different ways, and there is a ruler that's going to come forth and he's going to be the res and it's going to be he's going to be responsible for allowing that to happen. And one thing about it, again, is that we all know that slavery is not something that we, especially as black folks, like to talk about or remember. Because, again, it's not something that is admirable, for one, you know, and it's something that really that was beaten or actually that was done to make one class feel superior to the other. You know, and again, that's nothing more than sin. So, again, all of these horns are actually representing, you know, again, different acts, different things that's going to be happening in the society, and it's going to be that there's going to be someone who's actually a demonic king, if you will, that's going to be responsible for bringing forth that particular action, whatever it may be. And we have to really understand that, but he says that those ten horns represents what's going to be happening in the future to the people who are going to be living in the future that's going to have to endure, you know, hardships because of something that they couldn't control, which is, of course, the color of their skin. You know, so again, you know, it's something I believe that's really worth further researching and further, you know, developing and, you know, and just kind of learning, you know. But again, you know, I, when I read across this and found this out, you know, in reading, you know, and studying and running scriptures and references, and I'm like, wow. So you mean to tell me that one of those horns? I mean, we know that slavery existed, but I never knew that, you know, that horn that, you know, that those horn represented those uh those particular facts about our, you know, our history or about the civilization of the world as we know it. You know, it's, it's very amazing. Now, one thing that we also have to understand, too, is that, you know, even though you have the beast, the scarlet beast and everybody, you know, working in cahoots with this woman that is represented, you know, as the city of Babylon. What we got to understand is that <laughs> in I think at the end of I think the 17th chapter of Revelations, we hear that, you know, there was a great fight or something where, you know, the lady's ally, which was that uh, scarlet beast, began to turn on her, which means that there begins to be a great fall, meaning that, you know, there's an attack, you know, different ideas. Somebody actually wants to be more than the other person, you know, that sort of thing. So now we're left with a situation now where, you know, you have two people or two entities that used to be allies with one another that are now attacking one another. So now what this means that now the uh, the ruler or the reign is not as strong as it once was because now one person sees or one entity sees the other as a threat. You know, so one thing about it is again, is that when you actually have two opposing things or two opposing entities fighting against each other, you're going to have a great fall. And pretty much that's what brings us to the next aspect of um, this particular study now, which we're talk, which I'm going to talk about, which is, again, what we would call the Great Fall of Babylon. It's amazing how these things ca actually goes along and how you stumble up on these things and learn, you know, the sequence of how all of this comes about. But again, again, the uh, fall of Babylon comes as a result of the ally or the evil spirits or, you know, the beast and, you know, the lady that's represented as the city of Babylon, they're clashing because, again, you know, they're not really, I guess, on the same, uh, on the same, how can I say, program, if you will. You know, they're being programmed now <laughs> to fight against each other. So now that they're being programmed to fight against each other, so here we go again. Now the whole city, the whole world, the whole nation is going to suffer now because you have two 
things, entities that were once allies that really can't stand the sight of each other, so to speak. Now, but what we have to really understand is that the fall of Babylon within itself is actually very symbolic. Okay, and it means that it's going to, again, bring to an end a lot of things, again, that we know of. And I think a lot of it is really, you know, what we've uh, c come uh, accustomed to here as uh, living human beings, human beings on this earth. But one thing about it is that I really want to go in and just kind of highlight some of them for you. So, again, the fall of Babylon, it means what? The end of practicing evil. You know, the end of what? Corrupt governmental greed. Or and also what we would call the quote unquote good life, and I'm going to get into all of that in a minute, and of, co of course a host of all other type of sinful acts, you know, and I can go on and on with this again because that covers, you know, a whole lot of things. I mean, name it. I'm pretty sure that you could name something. Okay, so I'm not going to really dwell too much on that. But what I wanted to want to under really want people to understand is that the main heart of the city of Babylon is that those were people. This is a nation that actually was uh, dependent on their wealth. And see, one thing about it is that when you actually have a, a nation that is actually collapsing and falling, for the most part, there has to be a reason for that. And the reason for that is because God sits high and looks low, and he knows that for the most part, you have a lot of people that are really stealing and taking what's not really theirs. Financial, you know, financially, I mean, we have it every day where you are list, looking at people that are actually having their uh, savings account, their IRAs and everything caught up in some sort of get rich quick get rich uh, quick scams that are actually developed by people who know how to manipulate books it's like they're stealing from folks and actually trying to take something that does not belong to them it wasn't their hard work that uh that gave that uh that produced that sort of money but they actually want to take it and actually manage it and manipulate it and make it work for them as opposed to the people who were who they were entrusted you know to actually uh you know handle their funds you know, and we see a lot of this these days on the television where you have people that are actually profiting off of somebody else's retirement. You know, and that's why it makes it so hard for folks now these days to really want to invest in anything because they are afraid that the person does not is in it just for themselves. But what we got to understand is that, again, the fall of Babylon means that it's going to be the end of financial security for pretty much those who really rely on the material that money to get them through that money that continues to to uh, I guess to keep their heads above waters if you will okay and what we have to do is we got to really understand that is the core of what this whole thing about the fall of Babylon is all about in order for a nation to be able to continue to function it doesn't matter how good or how evil it is there has to be some sort of financial resources available for them to continue to function. Just like when they actually had, you know, this war going on, you know, money had to be exchanged, you know, overseas, you know, with, you know, the 9-11 terrorist attacks and Al-Qaeda and stuff. Money had to still be in the place somewhere in order for people to be able to uh, go and hide out in caves, you know, produce more weapons to fight against the enemy and everything like that. So what God has to do again, he's going and he's going to hit in the heart of all operations to make sure that this evil get is that he has to get rid of evil for good. And the root of all of this is, is nothing more than the financial resources that the city has. And for the most part, again, the main people who are actually really going to get really, I, I mean, burnt or I should say, I shouldn't say burnt, but actually judged are going to be those who actually, again, depend on their money for everything. I mean, you have people that depend on their money, you know, to for, I mean, just for being happy. I mean, understand, folks, and I guess I have, I guess this is worth mentioning. I guess I got to stop and kind of digress for a moment. We have a lot of people these days that are actually on there advocating that, and I and God help them, I don't know if they are just ignorant to the scripture or maybe they just need to go back and refresh themselves about, you know, the resources that we have. The, God, the Bible tells us that God made everything and everything that God made is good. All right. But one thing that we have to understand is that when we misuse resources that God gives us, that's when it actually becomes evil. Now, the resources, again, I'll repeat. Originally, it's good. It's to help us to live. It's to help us survive. It's to help us to continue on. But when we actually try to go and actually get this evil way of thinking of how we can use it, that's when it becomes sinful to us. A lot of people are quick to say that money is the root of all evil. And I'm quick to tell folks that you need to go back and really read the scripture and really understand what the Bible says about those type of resources. 
having money is necessary to live in this day and time. You have to use it to pay bills, you use it to go to college, you use it to go to do all court sort of things, you know, to buy a house. I mean, it's needed. But when you take it and you begin to love that money, love that resource, and you give it attention, and when you give something, you start to develop more of, you know, different ways on how to get more of it. That's when it becomes the root of all evil. When you become too enjoy it too much to where it causes you to actually think evil to do evil to plot against someone to cheat against someone that's when it becomes tainted to you the love of money is the root of all evil money is not evil people I get so tired of hearing people say that and I'm like I'd be, I'm wanting to scream because one thing about it is that it's a shame when we go out throughout life misquoting scriptures and there's and then when someone corrects you, you get angry. Because one thing about it is that if you don't correct it at the, at the very core, that lie is going to continue to go on and on. And it's going to go into a new generation and everything like that. And you're going to have people saying, well, money is evil. No, it's not. Everything that God made, he made because there's a purpose for it. But we as humans decide that, OK, well, you know what? And maybe I can do this, you know, and I can get more of it or I can do something where it can actually benefit me. And that's where it becomes a problem. But see, one thing about it, going back to uh, get back on the uh, road here, going back to how this is actually that type of thinking here uh, is going to be handled. This is the reason why, you know, this, these are the type of people that's going to be really affected by the great fall of Babylon. Because, again, we've heard of issues, uh, uh, again, where, uh, you know, the financial markets were in danger. We heard about that, you know, when we saw the 9-11 uh, attacks, when we actually had, you know, the, the collapse of the stock market. What about that recession in 2008 where people lost a whole bunch of their investments? And you had a lot of people that were out there, you know, prowling, warning, and taking old folks' retirements. I mean, and then pocketing it and then just walking away like it's nobody's business. I mean, people are ridiculous. When people get their backs against the wall, they will kill. They will destroy. It doesn't matter. They will they will take and do anything they can because it's an act of desperation to survive because they know that if that's gone, they don't have anything else because that's all that they know. And that's a sad thing to do and to be in when you actually surround your entire being around money. But we have a lot of people that are like that, folks. Also, too, those who acquired much wealth you know, in luxury, they're going to sit there and sit and watch idly by while their whole life's work, if you want to put it that way, is going to be gone up in smoke for the most part. And there is going to be nothing that they can do about it. That is a very bad situation to be in when you see all of your all of somebody else's stuff, because it's, most of the time it's not even theirs by the way that this is brought to me. You're going to sit there and see all of what you're trying to do and all that you're trying to acquire. You're going to see it that since you don't want to do good by it, you don't want to help anybody, guess what? God says, I'll blow on it. So what? It's gone. And that's a bad shape to be in, folks. But one thing about it is that the city of Babylon is known, you know, to have people, you know, that brag on being able to be financially independent, being able to, you know, put their money to fight their battles and stuff like that. I mean, my God, I mean, even in this day and time, you actually people have people that actually went out and blatantly broke laws. But yet still, when they went to court, they actually went free because of the uh, case of affluenza. And we've heard of that. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I guess money does, I guess, have privileges in certain things. But one thing about it, even in that, God is still going to come back and he's going to make the unjust just. And that's just what this whole thing is about. Going and actually getting rid of evil and bringing back justice and bringing back to things the way it was supposed to be. Okay? What we got to understand is that out of all of this that's going on, the main people who stand to lose a lot are those who really, you know, did not have their, uh, their dependency on the right source. And one thing about it is that sad, all sad to say these days, we have a lot of people that are trusting in too many different things. And I know this touched me personally. Because one thing about it is that you can sit here and talk and teach things, but one thing about it is that when you actually can teach it and see yourself in it, that is something, you know, that I say thank you, God. Because one thing about it is that God can allow, can allow you to die in that, and you'll be lost forever. But one thing that we have to understand is that we cannot put our dependency on, on things that we can see. God tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. He also says that the just shall live by faith. 
But see, one thing about it is that, again, if you want to turn around and look at a second aspect, this is, a, this is an eternal judgment to those who chose to really not to walk by faith. They're really to choosing to put their trust in things that they can believe, that they can see, feel, and touch. Which, of course, goes against the entire concept of trusting in God or knowing who God is, you know, at all. So what we have to understand and know is that the end of Babylon, he's going in and the whole point about this is that he's going and he's going to actually deal with it at its very core. And when he deals with this at its very core, then guess what? You're going to see a lot of people that's going to be affected by it. And the sad part about it is that there's nothing that they're going to be able to do about it because they caused it on themselves by being haughty. By being, uh, as you call, uh, very arrogant because they feel that they can get away with things. You got even people think that they can even buy their way into heaven because of the resources that they own. That's when you know that something is wrong. You, you've gotten way, I, you've gotten so far that I can't even reach you. So, But, you know, again, God has a way of humbling. And sometimes he has to snatch that security blanket, that financial blanket, in order to get your attention. Sometimes God has to save us from ourselves. We have to really think about that. Because if we, he lets us and uh, cause us to continue to run and behave and act crazy, we'll end up running into a brick wall and really end up doing a lot more harm, you know, than what was originally intended. I mean, some things, I mean, you can't, you can't avoid. I mean, there are certain things in life that, you know, that you're just going to have to endure. I mean, that's all a part of being in this fight. But one of the, the, what some of the things that God is saying that his people are going through things because, again, they don't have to. It's because they put themselves in there. If only you would trust and believe. And I know that goes for me especially for me and I praying every day for the Lord God to work on my faith to increase my faith it's a process but at least it's a pro it's a process where it's actually progressing and it's actually getting a closer you know in the right direction as opposed to the day before so I continue that you, I hope that you all got something out of this teaching you know and like I said you know more teachings are on the way we're going to be talking about the after effects of when all of this uh evil is rid of and what's going to be happening after the fall of Babylon. All right. You all continue to be blessed. And again, more teachings coming soon.